The Tom Woods Show. Welcome, everybody. It is Friday, December 6th, 2013. Tom Woods here. We're going to talk today, finally, about Pope Francis and his apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium. I'm going to talk only about the economic passages, and even then, probably not all of them. I'm in a bit of haste here. I've got the program broadcasting about an hour from now, and here I am recording it just now, but that's my schedule these days. Before I get to this, a couple of quick notes. Remember, you guys, I had a Black Friday special, 35% off gift subscriptions to my libertyclassroom.com website. Libertyclassroom.com is the place you can learn the real history and economics you probably didn't get in school, and it's going to be taught by me and by people I trust, and you get Q&A forums and downloadable courses you can listen to in your car, and it's super fun. But I'm extending the 35% off offer just for you guys, just for people who listen to this program. I'm not publicizing this anywhere else. So you can get that deal for that special person in your life by going to libertyclassroom.com slash secret. Ah, And then also my thanks, once again, continuing thanks to people who help us keep the lights on here in my special Tom Woods show office where I'm able to make these programs in peace and quiet by going first to TomWoodsRadio.com before entering Amazon. Enter Amazon from the little widget at TomWoodsRadio.com, and then at no cost to you when you're making your Amazon purchases, you'll be also helping us out. All right, so let's dig into this document. There's a lot that can be said about the non-economic portions, but I'm just going to focus on the economic stuff because I'm sort of known for talking about this stuff because I have a book on it. I wrote a book called The Church and the Market. came out in 2005. I actually think it's one of the best things I've ever done. I'm very happy with it. The only thing that disappoints me about it when I look back on it now is that the tone sometimes is not quite right. Like Sometimes I'm just too angry at people in this book. I'm too impatient with people, and that's not a good thing. Like, I've, if I had it to do over again, I would modify some of the passages. But the book, The Church and the Market, really is more or less an introduction to Austrian economics, like all the topics you would expect, from method and praxeology to prices and wage rates and business cycles and banking and monopoly and all the sorts of topics you would expect to be covered are covered in there. So if you're thinking to yourself, I've read Economics in One Lesson, but I'm quite ready to read Human Action by Mises. Well, the church and the market can be a kind of intermediate text for you, whether you're a Catholic or not. I've had a lot of people who aren't, don't belong to any religion at all who say that I learned a lot from this book. So I think you might enjoy that. But anyway, that's why I'm really focusing on the economic aspect. But I do want to just say a little something about sort of the political dynamics here. Like people try to say, there is no such thing as left and right. You're either an Orthodox Catholic or you're a dissenter, but there is no left and right within the Church. That's just not true. I mean, that is unbelievably superficial. Of course there's a left and a right within the Church. There clearly is, because those terms do still mean things. And in terms of your attitude toward the modern world, your attitude toward liturgy, your attitude toward change in the Church, your attitude toward the type of language that churchmen ought to be using, all these things have left-right considerations behind them. They all have application to those terms. So, for example, Pope Francis clearly is a left liberal. There's no getting around this. He clearly is in terms of his views on pretty much everything. Again, his attitude toward the world, his attitude toward the priority of some issues over others, his attitude toward liturgy. If this isn't left liberal, then nothing is. And ever since Vatican II, we really don't have conservatives in the Church anymore. And I know this will come as a surprise to the average person who just reads the newspaper who thinks Pope John Paul II was a real conservative. Well, yeah, I know that's what David Brinkley and Ted Koppel and uh, Cokie Roberts would say, but they would also say that Newt Gingrich is a big right-winger, right? Like, you wouldn't trust them on that either. And John Paul II had his merits, to be sure, but he was not a conservative in the, in the old mold of a Pope Pius XII or St. Pius X, certainly not. Basically, all churchmen, with maybe a handful of exceptions, I can think of Cardinal Stickler, for example, whose memoir I translated from German into English, uh, he, was a, he was an old-style conservative. But a conservative in the mold of Cardinal Ottaviani from the 60s, there is no such thing in the College of Cardinals. You have left-wing liberals and you have right-wing liberals. John Paul was a right-wing liberal. 
Benedict the Sixteenth is the closest thing the papacy has seen to a conservative, but he still, by and large, was a right-wing liberal. He did and said things that his predecessors would have died before doing or saying. And I say that as somebody who admires him. I, I wrote a book basically on his views on liturgy, my book Sacred Then and Sacred Now. So I'm not saying this as a criticism, although I suppose it's a, an implied one, but just simply as a description. Like, I don't think these statements I've just made are even debatable, if you're defining your terms correctly. But So let's turn to this document now. I do want to make one clarifying note right at the beginning. Number 204 of Evangelii Gaudium, the apostolic exhortation we're going to be talking about here, he says, uh, the Pope, Pope Francis, that uh, we, need a, we need decisions, programs, mechanisms, and processes specifically geared to a better distribution of income. That He's saying that the free market does not yield us a good distribution of income. It doesn't yield us a just distribution of income. But this is simply a category mistake, right? Because, of course, there is no distribution of income on the free market. There isn't, there's no distribution mechanism at all. The free market is just a series of exchanges. Like, there's a lot of boogeyman language, unfortunately, in this document about the wickedness of the free market, the wickedness of capitalism. But the free market and capitalism are really just an array of exchanges. That's really all it is. So exchanges generally aren't evil or good. They're just exchanges, right? Exchanges are exchanges. So some people sell things and other people buy them, and that's it. That's the free market. So there's no notice there's no distribution mechanism anywhere in this. Some people sell things, other people buy things. Nothing is being distributed. So therefore, there can't be a just distribution or an unjust distribution on the market, right? There's just exchanges. So this is, a, this is an, an error, a common error, but an error all the same. Now, I really want to hone in on a statement in number 53 here in the document, because this is such a common misconception that it really, really needs to be addressed. Uh, The Pope writes, Today everything comes under the laws of competition and the survival of the fittest, where the powerful feed upon the powerless. Okay, well that's not a reasonable statement, and I want to explain why. And at the end I'll explain, well gee, can, can you still be a good Catholic and Say, well, you don't have to get a lobotomy to be a Catholic. That's my bottom line. So I'm going to explain at the end why it is okay for somebody to say, I think there's a problem here. In fact, in fact, just a few weeks ago, there were a couple of traditional Catholic uh, writers who got in trouble, or at least one traditional Catholic writer in Italy who got in trouble wherever it was they worked for being apparently inordinately critical of Pope Francis. And they actually got fired. I don't know if it was from a newspaper or whatever. They got fired for this. So Pope Francis gets on the phone and calls this writer personally and says, you know, I have no problem with anything you said because criticism is a good thing. I need criticism. I don't need yes-men constantly. I need criticism. So this is hilarious, all these people who try to be more Catholic than the Pope saying, you're not allowed to criticize him. Well, the Pope himself says you are, so shut up. (laughs) I loved hearing about this. He said, look, I know that the criticisms you made were made out of love. I know these criticisms were made with a concern for the well-being of the Church. So that's fine. All right, anyway, we'll say more about that later. But it's precisely in a pre-capitalist economy where the division of labor is poorly established, where capital investment is basically nil, that's where only the fittest survive. That's where the strong triumph over the weak. And Hayek pointed out that before the Industrial Revolution, people who could not make a living in agriculture and who lacked the tools to support themselves in a craft had no way to integrate themselves into the economy at all. The wealth and the employment opportunities that the market economy creates is what makes possible the sheer survival of countless millions of the world's weakest and most vulnerable people. For these people, the necessities of life would not have existed in sufficient abundance to keep them alive. So it's precisely the market that makes possible the survival of the poorest and most vulnerable. These people would have died for lack of anything to do and for lack of sufficient sustenance to go around sufficiently per capita. And how did that happen? Well, it's the capital investment that the unhampered market economy encourages, that increases people's real incomes over time, 
and makes the necessities of life less expensive over time relative to wage rates. And as I've explained many times before, when firms increase and improve the equipment and machinery at the disposal of workers, those workers' labor becomes more productive. So take my father, who was a forklift operator in a food warehouse. Imagine him now using a forklift as opposed to, what, stacking pallets with his bare hands? Or imagine somebody producing books with modern equipment as opposed to a 16th century printing press. The amount of production the economy is capable of is thereby increased, often dramatically, and this increase in production puts d corresponding downward pressure on consumer prices relative to wage rates. Now, there's nothing natural or inevitable about the availability of this productivity-enhancing capital equipment. It doesn't fall out of the sky. It comes from the capitalist's abstention from consumption, and the allocation of these unconsumed resources into capital investment. This process is the only way the general standard of living can rise. Only in this way can the average laborer produce even the tiniest fraction of what today he's accustomed to producing. And so it follows that only under these conditions can he expect to be able to consume the tiniest fraction of what today he's accustomed to consuming. All right, let me put this another way. The increases in the productivity of labor that additional capital brings about push prices down relative to wage rates. And by dramatically adding to the overall amount of output, these increases in the productivity of labor raise the ratio of consumer goods to the supply of labor. And so if I can put this even more simply, improvements in the production process that lead to an increased supply of output make that output cheaper and easier for people to acquire. And so that's why in order to earn the money necessary to acquire a wide range of necessities, far fewer labor hours are necessary today than in the past. And because of capital investment, which is what businesses engage in when their profits are not seized from them by government, our economy is more physically productive than it used to be, and therefore consumer goods exist in far greater abundance and are correspondingly less dear relative to wage rates than before. It's interesting to note, by the way, that Pope Leo XIII, back in Rerum Novarum in, the, in uh, 1891, said he made, had the anti-Marxist insight that labor and capital are harmonious, that labor and capital are not locked in an eternal struggle with one another, but they're complementary. Well, that's an extremely important anti-Marxist insight. And of course, as we've just seen, we now see how that anti-Marxist insight works out in the real world. Both capital and labor both want capital investment to be as unhampered and free as possible. They want as little taxation on this process as possible, because this is the only way to increase the standard of living of the worker. And it also increases the well-being and the prosperity of the firm itself. On this survival of the fittest point, I want to share with you a lengthy passage from George Reisman, the economist. We had him on the program in the past. He says, The economic competition that takes place under capitalism is radically different from the biological competition that prevails in the animal kingdom. In fact, its character is diametrically opposite. The animal species are confronted with scarce nature-given means of, subsist of subsistence whose supply they are unable to increase. Man, by virtue of his possession of reason, can increase the supply of everything on which his survival and well-being depend. Thus, instead of the biological competition of animals striving to